I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break.
in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough. Say that again. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Clarence, where, where is that in the scripture? I think I know, but for the sake of others, where, where is that? Revelation chapter 1. 1-8. Revelation chapter 1, read that when you get home because that was a powerful word from the Lord. Amen. Amen is what it says right there. Amen. Praise God. B Brother Bill's going to come and pray for the United States of America. And we're going to do this each uh, Sunday until uh, voting day. Yeah. So, Brother Bill, God bless you, man. Good morning. How many of you know that God's, in, that God's in control at all times? I believe that truly. But I also believe as a body of Christ that we need to come together and petition God to do the things that we want him to do in a godly manner for this country and our leadership. Amen. We have a darkened, we came to a darkened place in this country. We've lost our way. We don't know what we're doing. 
I'm going to go with a few scriptures, wow. and then I want you to stand with me and pray. Because yes. I, I'm, I'll be 54 years old. I've always been active in, in elections, but it's the first one I've ever prayed for. We're off the rails. We have to get it back together. Amen. Can everybody please stand. Amen. Amen. Everybody, yeah, please, if please you can, do. please stand. Proverbs 29, 2. When the righteous strive, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Proverbs 29, 16. When the wicked are in authority, sin flourishes, but the godly live to see their downfall. We're going to make it. We're going to see them lose. Yeah. But my thing is, I want to try to save them now to give us more time in order for us to, to do our part to save more eternal lives. Yes. Right now, I think we're off the rail, and if it keeps going the way it is, I don't think we're going to have too much more time to reach more people. That's wow. why this is so important. Wow. Wow. Then on Isaiah 5 of 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, and who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Turn on the TV. They're changing the, the names and, the, and the, the definitions of words. They're telling you that, hey, just do whatever you want. God loves you. He wants you to be happy, so whatever makes you happy, go do it. Couldn't be further from the truth. It's, we got to reject it. Second Chronicles 714, and this is a critical part. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's where we're at now, and that's what we got to do. Dear yes. Heavenly Father, I come to you in prayer. Yes, I pray, Lord. Father God, that you put your hand yes, on this upcoming election. Not only the presidential election, Father God, but all the way up and down the ballot. Yes. We've got to take control, Father God, for your glory. Yes. And we also pray, yes. Father God, that you take the Holy Spirit and convict these folks that's been in office for so many years. Let them come to the podium and say, look, I've been in office for 50 years and I've been deceiving you the entire way. The only people I helped was my donors. Let them come. Let them give them a chance to repent yes. and get right yes. and also to bring further Amen. light to the situation. Yes. These things, Father God, we ask in your son's holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Everybody said amen. Boy, wow. Thank you, Brother Bill. Brother, if you're ready, God love you. Praise God. Yes. 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 That's what it says.
Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Brother Steve. God love you, friend. Amen. Sunday school could be dismissed after the offering. God love you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. How many of y'all appreciate this, these platform workers today? I tell you, I do. I, man, they're so dedicated. They really are. They put a lot of time and a lot of heart and a lot of prayer uh, in what they do. And when we sense God's presence, I think that's... Uh, coming out because there's so much commitment on their part. I really do. We cry unto the Lord. He hears us, right? So, thank you. Thank you, Cameron, Meredith, and Christian. Hallelujah. I'm going to get some earrings like that. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to spend just a few, a little bit of time today, first of all, to say God love each visitor today that's here in the room. And uh, <clears throat> God bless you. If you're visiting for the first time, would you please stand just for a second? It's first time. God bless you, man. God bless you. We pray that your visit here will be uh, one among many. Amen. We really do. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, fellas. Hallelujah. Today, at the conclusion of the service, uh, the, I felt the Lord gave me this. I, I did, and uh, it's, it's uh, to be declared clean, to be declared clean. We're going to be praying this prayer uh, after the service today, okay? And there will be <clears throat> a copy of it back there for you at, where's TT, where, where'd TT go? She was here just a minute ago. Oh, she's out. Oh, that's right. She went to class. Well, we're going to make her really busy today. Amen. I ask her to pass these out after the service, so while, when you're leaving, be sure to see TT, because she's going to get you one of these, okay? Because you may want to put this on your refrigerator, I don't know. I'm going to be having one every week for every one of these um, things that I'll be speaking on for the rest of this year. Praise God. Would you <clears throat> turn with me, please, in your Bible um, to a familiar place. Uh, in Scripture, and we're going to be uh, speaking this same verse. We're still dealing with the subject of um, vexed. I've been teaching on that now for, I don't know, three weeks, and I, I just want to um, uh, speak on this again today. I'm going to be speaking on the same uh, spirit that we were dealing with last week, and that is a wounded spirit. A wounded spirit. Okay, I really felt like I needed to go over this again a little bit and then also give some fresh information as to what I feel a wounded spirit is. I know and I am convinced that the devil is real. I don't glorify him. I do not magnify him in any sense of the word. Uh, I've tried to, uh, in my life, always address Satan as just a defeated foe. He's defeated. And I was thinking the other day, you know, when I was saying, Satan, you know, the blood of Jesus is against you. You're just all messed up. You've been messed up ever since the beginning of time. <clears throat> and uh, I, th I felt like the Holy Spirit showed me uh, that when we put the blood of Jesus on the devil and we say, Satan, you're defeated, you know, we're a lot like uh, Smith Wigglesworth, an old-timey preacher. I don't know if you ever heard that uh, about Smith Wigglesworth, you know, a prophet of God, a man of God that was used by God powerfully, even raising the dead uh, just generations ago. And uh, he was sleeping one night, and while he was sleeping, uh, he was uh, suddenly awakened, <clears throat> and at the foot of his bed was a figure and Smith Wigglesworth look, looked up and said, oh, it's just you, devil. And he went back to sleep. 
And I think that's the way that God wants us to be able to understand. You know, we say, well, okay, he was defeated, the devil. He was defeated on the cross, and almost definitely he was. Never forget that, please. Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Satan was defeated. But you can go all the way back from the beginning of time and realize Satan was defeated in the beginning of time. He was cast down to the earth as lightning, the scripture says, and Jesus beheld his, his fall. He's been defeated, and he's been under the thumb of God Almighty, the God of all gods, the King of all kings, since the beginning of time. I want to tell you loud and clear, devil is defeated. Yes. Totally. So that's the way we should look at it. We, we don't really have to holler and scream at the devil when he's trying to mess with us. We don't have to get all... You know, your veins pop out and all that kind of thing. You don't have to get like that. You really don't. You might, and it's okay. Uh, I think every devil in the world will hear that. Amen? But uh, really, all we just need to do is say Satan and realize what he's about and uh, realize he's defeated. And just uh, say like Jesus said, Satan, get behind me. You don't understand the things that be of God. You're done. Okay? So I think that's going to be a good thing. And I think in this series, we're going to be able to come to a place in, as a church that we're going to be strong. You know why I say that is because I really feel in my heart, and this is something I would have you, if you would, please pray, because I really feel in my heart God is pouring out His Spirit in this place. And I also think in my mind, I don't like the word feel, so I'm getting away from that, but I like to think in my mind that God's going to come in in more of a big way uh, in this church. He's going to manifest some glory, His glory, that's going to astound us and help us to be all that God wants us to be. I think like Brother Bill just said just a moment ago, I don't think we have a whole lot of time to get done what we need to get done and get people to Jesus. We don't have much time. Have you ever thought about that? Christ is coming. He's coming. And I don't want to have my head in the sand uh, in, when he comes. And I want to say some things that help, may perhaps help you because multiplied millions of Christians that are in the evangel evangelical world today, if you know what I mean by evangelical, they're in the church world. They're in the evangel evangelical church world that I think in myself, according to the Word of God, is really a large portion of that is the apostate church. The apostate church being a church that will accept the Antichrist system readily, wholeheartedly. They won't be able to buy, sell, or eat, trade, all those kind of things. And when the Antichrist system is set up, during the, the tribulation days, the, the Antichrist spirit is already at work, has been since the beginning of time, which means to take people away from the true Christ. And I think today we're at a place in the church world and in history, the most deceptive, disabling, harmful time in the Christian world I've ever seen in my life after all these years of living for the Lord. I, I have a sense of urgency. If, he, if, if I can't get someone to Christ, I pray, God, would you let me today get someone to Christ the next day, the next day, because that's just the way I think. So, but I want you to turn with me to a place in the Bible we've been using for an anchor text, and it's found in Acts uh, chapter 5, verse 16, and also Proverbs 18 and 14. There's so much I'm going to say to you today, and I'm going to say it quickly, and then we're going to pray, okay? Can we do that? Can we look to Proverbs first, Mark, and hold your finger in Acts if you have your Bible? How many of you have your Bible today? God love you. Praise God. There's still some folks that bring their Bible. <clears throat> How many have a Bible app? Okay, we're all growing, right? Hallelujah. How many have uh, something about the Bible? 
<laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so here's Proverbs. I want to go to Proverbs quickly. Let's get this uh, in sync here. And we're going to go to Proverbs, and then we're going to go to the book of Acts, okay? Proverbs, the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. What is that saying? That's saying that your, your exterior man, your body, my body, uh, can have an infirmity. And how many of you know that the body, even medically speaking, can heal itself? The body, okay? The body. When COVID took place... Uh, you may have got the shot, and that's wonderful. I did not get the shot, uh, but I got a shot from Jesus. That's just me. That's just me. I don't condemn or, or, either, or either way. It doesn't make any difference. Thank God you followed what you felt you needed to do, and I did what I did, and uh, I feel just fine. Hallelujah. In fact, I want to take some of you jogging for six miles today. Ready? Ready? Okay. Hey, you're in my league, man. Praise God. So, <clears throat> a wounded spirit who can bear. So, the infirmity of the body heals itself. God designed us. I, I was reading about a medical doctor the other day, uh, and he said there's no reason why that the human heart shouldn't beat forever. The human heart. My heart, your heart. It's designed, he said it was, is designed in such a way it should pump forever. That's like outstanding. But he said a wounded spirit, a wounded spirit, or a broken spirit, or a spirit, a spirit that has been afflicted, broken, or stricken. That's what wounded spirit means. Afflicted, broken, restricted, and that's what it means. So understand this before we go to the next verse and pray over this, these two verses because the spirit of man can heal his own infirmity physically. But the spirit of man cannot heal a wounded spirit by itself. It takes the Holy Spirit, and so this is what I'm going to say to you and suggest to you this morning is, allow the Holy Spirit. How many are acquainted of, to the, of the Holy Spirit? You're acquainted with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know when the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, right? You know the voice of God versus your own voice, right? You know the voice of the devil versus the voice of the Holy Spirit, Right? And you know the voice of others when they're speaking of the Holy Spirit are not speaking, or, or they are not speaking of the Holy Spirit. Do you know the difference? Yes. See, it's going to be imperative in these days to come quickly that we learn to discern spirits, not discern people, but discern spirits. We need to know that human beings carry spirits. So do animals. I'm not going to talk about that right now, but listen to me. <laughs> There's spirits running rampant in our world today, and they're not spirits of God. Let's look at Acts chapter uh, 5, verse 16 there. If you could put that on there. There came also a multitude. This astounds me because when I look at that, there came a multitude. That multitude came because there was stuff happening in the church world that God was putting his finger on. Two people dropped dead, Ananias and Sapphira, in church. Because they lied to the Holy Ghost. They lied to the Spirit of God. The Bible says they dropped dead. So then the, a multitude of people was moved upon by the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 5, and fear of God, which means the all of God fell upon them, and they began to fear God instead of the ways of the world that were conducting themselves under the influence of spirits. So the Scripture says, there came a multitude out of the cities around about Jerusalem being sick with sick folks. 
Now that's re in reference to the body, right? Partially. Because sick people can be sick in their mind, too. People can be sick in their mind. And that can affect their life. And it could be an unclean spirit. The scripture says, and, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Now notice here, it does not say they were delivered. doesn't say they were delivered. They might have been delivered, but the, the Bible uses the this, this specific word and phrase, they were healed. He's using a physical word or a word that denotes the physical that also represented the spiritual and the mental. They were healed. That astounds me. Because there was a multitude, first of all, and the scripture says that Jesus healed them all. So would you bow your head, Father? Thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the Holy Scripture. Father, I know that I must decrease here this morning. I must completely get out of the way, and gladly so, Lord, because there's nothing I can do. But there is something I think that you could say through me that would help your people become strong, powerful, anointed citizens of the kingdom of God. I ask it in Jesus' name. Now, let me read this to you here uh, before we go any further. What does the word vex means? It means troubled, distressed, annoyed, agitated, irritated, shaken, or to be tossed about or devastated and afflicted. Now, you want me to read that again? Okay. Vex means troubled, distressed, annoyed, agitated, irritated, annoyed continuously, shaken, to be tossed about and devastated and afflicted. Now, I'm going to be saying this every week, so you're going to be able to get the gist of this and understand that that's what vexed means. Now, if I would have you raise your hands today and say, how many of you would think and understand and look around you today that we're living in a world that is completely and astronomically and very real dealing with a vexed situation? I mean, I talk to people all the time. I, I mean all the time about Jesus, constantly. Everywhere I go, I never meet a, a stranger, ever. And it's like, God, help me to influence other people. Are you like that? Are you like that? Am I the only one? There's only one? And he's a vi they're visitors, amen? Uh, is there anybody else like that? You really want to influence people for Christ? Okay, thank you. God bless you. So the reason I want to speak this, this series is because seven things about the tabernacle. Now, before I talk to you about the tabernacle is this. The tabernacle is you and me. Okay? This goes with this series because I'm the temple. You're the temple. Look at yourself and if you want to, go ahead and point at yourself and say, now don't hurt yourself, okay? But, you know, point at yourself <laughs> and say, I am the temple of the Lord. Okay, there's seven reasons why. God designed you as the Old Testament temple, tabernacle in the wilderness, as the temple of God in the New Testament. A place, number one, to meet with his people. This is God's intention. He wants to meet with his people. So when you come to church, you don't want to think, okay, I'm just going to have a good time, you know, and everybody's going to bless me, and I'm really going to get something from the Lord. Have you ever thought that when you come to church, we need to give something to the Lord? Anybody here? We need to give something to the Lord. And what is that? That's praise, worship, adoration, thanksgiving. I don't think we should come to church saying, well, I'm going to get something from God. I think we should come to church initially to give something to God. Okay? So a place to meet with His people. Number two, a place for worship. 
Now listen to me carefully. I'm going to speak to you as a pastor right here real quick. A place to worship. When they start up, they, I say they, I know their names, all of them, Cameron Christian and uh, Meredith and uh, my precious wife, I call her little Christine, okay? (laughs) Hallelujah. And when they fire up the service to give you uh, uh, an opportunity to join in the worship that's happening from this platform, listen, God does not want us to be distracted in any way. Not one way. Amen. If you've got to use, if you've got to take a water break, take it before you come to church. I knew they'd go over real well. I just knew it. I just knew it. But listen, worship is worship to Almighty God, and He deserves our, our, our attention totally and completely. There should be no talking to one another. There should be no uh, absence in the mind of as to why we're here. There should be nothing distracting us. Our hands should be in the air and his name needs to be elevated. His name needs to be glorified and then he will see that we're fully addressing him. I needed to say that, and I hope you didn't get upset, amen, because I won't get upset at all, because if you're upset, I'll just pray and say, Father, thank you that you're moving by your Spirit. So, uh, for worship, and it's to meet for the journey, to meet God for the journey. Number three, we're on a journey. Yeah, and to strengthen His people and to stay with His people, to stay. God's intention in the Old Testament with Moses and the children of Israel, he told them to go to their tent door and God would meet with them there. Where does God tell us to go now? He tells us to allow the door to be opened of our heart. He knocks on our heart and he wants us to open the door. It's no different from the Old Testament and the New. Now the door is our lives. God wants that door to be completely opened unto his cause. Totally. So it's the same. So he wants to restore himself, number five, and to fallen man. And then number six, he wants to give an invitation for us to look to God. And then number seven, he wants our past, our present, and our future to be completely fulfilled. There's people in this room and people watching on the internet. We're not on, I guess we're on TikTok today. I don't know our TikTok uh, uh, media person in department. Oh, she's here now. Okay, good. We are on TikTok. By the way, God bless you, TikTok. We have about eight, <laughs> yeah, we, we have about 800 or more, or some, I don't know exactly, but somewhere around 800 people that watch on TikTok every week. I'm not afraid of TikTok. <laughs> I can even spell TikTok, right? I can spell it. Yeah, if I can't, you'd help me, right? Okay, but we're so thankful for our TikTok audience because most of them, a lot of them, are young people. And I'm excited to be able to speak to young people. And TikTok fans and TikTok uh, viewers, I want you to know that today I'm going to be saying some stuff from the Word of God, and I want you to think about it. Okay? And God wants you to think about it. See, we're living in a time where we are heavily bombarded with spirits. And one of the major, I think is a major spirit that is of the world is a, is a spirit of being wounded. A wounded spirit. The Bible talks about all kinds of spirits. The spirit of bondage, the spirit of fear, uh, the spirit of jealousy, uh, the spirit of whoredom, the spirit of, of uh, uh, seducing spirits and so on and so forth. The Bible talks about a lot of spirits. And listen, all of these spirits that we're going to be dealing with are not the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, but we're going to be talking about unclean spirits. So unclean spirits are trying to attach themselves. And I want to say this to you before I go any further with this. And I I need to say it. I need to clarify it. I haven't clarified it to this point, but I am right now, okay? Would you give me your best ear? Let Let me right here right now. That these unclean spirits, now hear me carefully, these unclean spirits 
that have come from the domain of hell, they are unclean spirits that have attached themselves to Christians even. And we don't recognize them because no, not very many preachers have stood up to talk about the real issue. I mean, I'm hearing it all week. You know, I'm, I'm looking on the internet and every preacher I've been listening to, I mean just a bunch of them, all of them are talking about the reality of the devil and the goodness of God. I don't know if you've been getting that or not. But listen to me, when we're dealing with these unclean spirits, I believe these unclean spirits that are in the world are coming and trying to make entrance into our lives. And I'm not going to sit here and argue with you that a, a Christian can be demon-possessed. I'm going to stay completely out of that. But I can tell you this, Christians can be strongly influenced by unclean spirits. I'm convinced of it. Totally convinced. And here's the point. I don't believe it's the fault of the Christian all the time. Now listen to me. If a Christian is living and practicing sin, you're going to have some problems and you better put a flag up cold red. Because you're going to have some devils trafficking in and out of your life like you wouldn't believe. Are you with me? You living in adultery? Did, yeah. Okay. You live in lies? Okay. You are living in uh, perverdity? I know men. I'm not naming any men. I don't, I don't even think about no one. But I know men that are perverted. They're so perverted that they'll prey on children. That's perversion. With me? Okay? So you got to understand their spirits trying to attach themselves and strongly influence Christians today. I believe it with all of my heart, including myself. And here's what I think, and here's what I think the Bible's teaching, is that Christians are being taken captive by unclean spirits by the will of the devil and not the will of themselves because I say that because of this. Christians that are, on, that, are, uh, that are consecrated, that's the word I want, Christians that are consecrated unto the Lord that really love God, and that's us, right? We really love God. Don't want to do some of the things that they do that are contrary to God, but they do them anyhow. What is that? That's the devil taking you captive at his will. In other words, he's illegally trespassing in your life. My life. I need to recognize it. Now, let me, let me give you this right here. I'm, I'm going to give you seven layers of how the devil... So, listen, I don't want you to feel condemned today. Everybody take a deep breath. I'm going to try some yoga on you. Can I? Take a deep breath. And that's as far as yoga will go in this pulpit. We won't go any further with yoga. Okay? Take a deep breath. Now, get ready to inhale the Word of God. Okay? And I'm going to show you something how the devil works. How he works. And then I'm going to get to my message. Okay? Then I want to get to my message. Okay, he works on a seven-layered diabolical attack against your life and my life. And this is the way he comes. Number one, he comes with regression. What is regression? Regression is to return to a place that was of less significance. In other words, when a person is living for God and then they think about turning backward, Where's backward? Backward is Egypt. Garlics and onions. How would you like to live that diet again? I like onions, but you better give me some barbecue with my onions. Okay? So regression is to return back to a place. What happens when a person is, the devil's working on a person with regression? They're thinking about not going ahead. They're going to give up. Okay? 
they're, they're just going to move back. They're just going to pull back. Relationships are like that. God's people can really just be carefree and loving and kind one to another, and all of a sudden something flares up and you don't agree with or they don't agree with or you both don't agree with, and all of a sudden you're fighting, you've had a fight, and one of you just exits the church. Because you say, I don't have to put up with that. You know what I would suggest to that kind of situation? Both of you humble yourself, get right with God, and take the defraudment and move on. Amen? Okay? Husbands and wives can do that. Yeah. You know how husbands and wives do it? Now, y'all look at me now. Everybody, you know, look at me now. Look at me. Amen? Y'all looking at me? Husbands and wives will do this kind of stuff. You've got to be real careful with this. You do, because you get into a little argument, you know, and you get into a little spat. Just You know, it's just a verbal agreement, dis disagreement, right? And you get in this little spat, and all of a sudden it becomes real heated. And the husband or wife will say, you're just like your mom. <laughs> oh, well, you're just like your dad. It's on, friend. Because there's characteristics that you can remember. You don't want to be like your dad. And you don't want to be like your mom. There's some good things you remember and you want to be like that. But it's always in that heated moment that husbands and wives just get this. You know, some people like myself, when I get into a little heated kind of situation, my earlobes get real hot. It's like, if you ever see my earlobes hot, pray for the pastor, will you? Pray real good, okay? So regression is something we need to avoid. Suppression is an action of supporting a, a forbidding situation. Suppression. Repression. The action of seducing someone or something by force. Now, can you see the layered attack or the dichotomy? You know, a dichotomy is a layered attack on... The, the, the devil uses to attack us, and where does he attack us first? Right here. The mind. So what are you? Your spirit, soul, and body. Your king, I've said this 116 times since I've been here at this church. I'll say it again. Your mind is servant. Okay? Your mind. Look at your mind, point at your mind, and say, hey, you're a servant, and you're going to do what my spirit tells you to do. Your spirit is king and it's ruled by God. It's ruled by this right here. So get this in you, okay? Get it in you every day. And your body is slave. Your body has to do what you, your spirit, your mind, your spirit tells your body what to do. Your body may want a drink, may want a nicotine satisfaction. Your body may want a drug. Your body may want a sexual activity. That your mind is your mind, will, and emotions, and your imagination. God had to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the imagination of the people was on evil continually. He had to destroy them. And if he had to do that in the Old Testament, what does he think about the imagination of pornography? The things we see on the internet, the things we see in this life on the television, internet, uh, in any kind of form, and the things that we're hearing, and the things that we're looking at, and the things that we're saying. Here's the crux of the matter. If, if Listen, there's, there's, there's spirits that will cause people to be under the control and under the influence, and they don't even have a say about it. That's called possession. So you understand that we're not talking about possession here, but we are talking about the influences that will produce possession. So understand today the fourth slide downward that Satan uses is depression. 
feelings of severe dependency and de dejection of oneself. Depression. Oppression. Now listen to this. Prolonged cruel or unjust treatment or control. Hear me now. I'm not being... Listen, I want you to take all the condemnation out of your thinking right here. This preacher is not up here to condemn you. I am here to help you. I'm here to help strengthen your life for Christ. I have no other motive. So don't be messing with thinking that you know my motive. Don't be doing that because you know what I'll do. I'll pray for you. Okay? So there is oppression which is prolonged, cruel, or unjust treatment or control. And then there's obsession. This is where a lot of people are right now in our world today. Yes? A lot of people. Obsession. What is obsession? The state of being obsessed with someone or something that you can't get things off your mind. Yeah. What causes these people to go to places in these big cities and throw people out in the street so they get ran over by cars? That's a session. What causes people to look at pornography and you think that's only men that do that? Friend, snap out of it. What do you think causes people to go murder someone and they're so bloodthirsty? I remember years ago that when we were in Terre Haute, Indiana, and I've told this story before that Timothy McVeigh that was the Oklahoma City bomber, it, I had the opportunity to go speak to him at Wabash, Wabash Prison and he canceled the appointment, but I prayed for him. And when, when I got wind that he had no state of repentance whatsoever in his life, he, he said that he was glad he'd done what he'd done and he would do it again ten times worse if he had the chance. That's Terre Haute, Indiana, Wabash Valley Prison. Do you understand what causes people to want to kill people? What causes people to want a murder in their mind? What causes people to commit adultery in their mind? Like Jesus said, when you look at a woman and you lust after her in your heart, you've already committed adultery. My God, sir, quit looking at women and addressing them in church. Yeah. Did you need to say that? Yes, I needed to say that. Because demon spirits are everywhere and they even come to church and listen, this preacher knows you witch doctors out there and I know you witches that have been praying cantations and praying mantras against this work but you're defeated in the name of Jesus. Would you give God praise this morning? I know who you are. I've seen your face and I have never met you. And I've seen you in my prayer chamber. Look out, because what you're doing is going to come back on you. I pray that you get saved before that happens. So obsession is something you can't get off your mind. You're consumed with it. A person gets consumed with it. Why is this stage of the attack of the devil on the church today? Because you know what he's after? He's after to assassinate you. He wants to assassinate you. He wants to assassinate your character. He wants to, to produce a spirit of defeatism inside you. That you've lived all this time and you lived all this life for Jesus and your life has went around a vicious circle and you can't see that you've grown from one year to the another and you even look back at decades and you're at the same place you were a decade ago. Why? Because of these unclean spirits. An unclean spirit of being wounded by yourself. Yes, you can wound yourself. I'm going to show you in a minute. You can be wounded by others. Somebody says something to you. I'm going to tell you something about being wounded by others. We've got to learn how to forgive them quickly. Quickly. Whomever they may be. 
and love them and move on. But listen, you can also be someone that is offended and wounded by God. I'm talking to a preacher right here, right now. I don't know who you are. I have no idea. I'm not thinking of anybody at all. Nobody. But I'm speaking right now as the Spirit of God speaks to me. You've been wounded in life. Your ministry didn't go like you thought it was going to go. You haven't achieved what you thought you ought to achieve. And you've gotten so discouraged and so despondent, you've walked away from God. And listen, I want to say this to you. God loves you. And God wants you to bring you back. You don't even know where you ought to go to church because you don't know if you could share any of what your hurt and pain is today with anybody because as a preacher, you don't know if they'd understand or not. I want to tell you something. This is a place that you can come and it's a safe place and it's a place where you can be healed of a wounded spirit. I needed to say that to my brothers and sisters that preach the gospel. I love the preacher. And God wants me to help if, if I can. He wants me to help. But then the last stage of a, de a dichotomy of the devil is possession, which means the state of having or controlling something or someone. So what ultimately is the devil after? He's after to control and possess the life of a human being. He wants to control. Don't give that to him. Recognize the spirit that's setting you back. You see, possession is to see, seize, and to take control of. But an unclean spirit is something that torments. It torments. It doesn't knock on your door all the time. It doesn't happen all the time. But every so often, somebody might say something, or you, you might feel dejected, or you might feel rejected, or you might think that nobody cares about you. Whatever the case is, and all of a sudden, that wounded spirit comes. Well, nobody cares anyway. Nobody really is with me anyway. You're isolated. You feel alone. You think that you're alone. You think... You think that you're the only person who has went through this kind of testing. That's a wounded spirit. I can tell you right now, everybody in this room has had a wounded spirit. Me included. Probably more so than, than anybody in here. I could tell you a story about nine years of age, eight, nine, eight and a half, nine years of age. I've told it before. In the front yard, we would have fights in our at our property and there was two men fighting over a woman I didn't understand any of that you know I wasn't interested in women I was interested in dozing with a dozer and backhoe you know but these two got in a fight they were blasted out of their mind drunk never forget it as long as I live nine years old one of them pulled out a knife this was a real situation cut this other man from here to here Bully fell out on the ground. His intestines fell out. And I never will forget the foul smell that came out of his body. I'll never forget it. I, didn't, I had never touched alcohol at that age, never touched it, whatever. And I'll never forget it. And I'll never forget uh, the man over. I didn't know at that time, but he was a paramedic. He came over and saved that man's life. He was, he was on the team of, as a paramedic. And God used him to save that man that was cut from here to here. Over a woman. I'll never forget it. What did it do to me? It left me with a wound in life. Some of you here today, 
you've got a wound from your childhood. That In your childhood, something took place, and it may have taken place more than one time. It may have happened over and over again, and it's a wound that's wide open. And every time something happens in your life, that wound opens back up, and you don't know what it is. I'm telling you today, it's an unclean spirit. It's something that wants to get in and wreak havoc in your life and cause commotion in your life. I believe with all of my heart this morning, every child of God needs to rise up and say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. You will not wound my spirit anymore and you will not distract me anymore and you'll not pull me back. I'm marching ahead. In fact, I'm on your head right now in Jesus' name. I think we need to get our weapons out of our warfare. It's not flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers and unclean spirits. And we need to take charge again as a church. Put your helmet on. Helmet of salvation. I'm saved. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. I'm the righteousness of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Devil, I don't care what I feel like. God told me I belong to him and I'm righteous. Glory to God. Put your shoes on. Get the gospel out. What does that mean? How is that going to help me? Let me tell you something. Anytime you tell somebody about Jesus and try to help somebody else, your problems will go... Why? Because you got your shoes on. God's given you authority as a believer. Take it. Use it. Hallelujah. All right, I, I feel like I'm up here by myself. I'm starting to get a complex. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not, am I? No. You see, these things that Satan does with a wounded spirit is not the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of the devil. It's the work of the devil. And it's something that I think we need to address. Now let me close with this. Because I think you need to see this. I think there's people in this room perhaps and watching, need, you need to hear this. That wounded spirit that I had at age 19 when that man's belly was ripped open with a knife. I can see it to this day. I'm 64 years of old age. And I can see it right here today. And because I can see it here, I see it here. Oh, it doesn't torment me. I found out a long time ago it was a wounded spirit as I walked with God and lived for God. But listen, see, a wounded spirit will distract you from your walk with God. How many of y'all ready to get out of this vicious circle you love God with all your heart, but you've been going around this circle. In fact, when you first got saved, God was doing this, this, and this. He was going... Psh, 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 psh. I wish I could whistle. <laughs> I mean, he was just moving, man. I mean, he's moving. Getting you jobs, and, and good jobs too. Doing this, this, and this. Got you a car. You didn't even know... You didn't even know what it meant to own a car. And it was a good car. He going, boom, 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 boom. But something happened, and you withdrew. And there was something from perhaps your childhood. You got mad at your, perhaps your, th your spouse. You got mad at your neighbor. You got mad at the person that you were closest to. And you just drifted away from one another. And you've been drifted ever since. Now listen to me. This not only can happen in marriages, but it can happen with people that are upset with God. Preachers do that a lot. I've done it before. And I had to recognize it. This, this thing about this, this hurt and pain. I woke up the other day. I say the other day. I'm starting to sound like an evangelist, right? That's what evangelists do. Well, the other day, you know... But I'm going to say it's been two, three weeks ago. Now listen to this. And I'm going to give you three things, perhaps four things, quickly, real fast, here in just a minute. But listen to this first. I woke up, and I normally, when I wake up in the morning, 
uh, Scarlett, I'm, I'm going, praise be unto the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God, God is good, we love you, Jesus, bless you, Jesus, good morning, Jesus. You know, how many of y'all like that? Good morning, Jesus. But that morning, that morning, evidently the devil had been working in my sublimable mind. In other words, he had been working in my mind while I was asleep. And don't think the devil can't do that. I didn't go to bed with a, a foul spirit on me. I didn't think. I didn't go to bed saying, I'm going to get back at God. I didn't go to bed saying, I'm going to, going to uh, 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 just be mean to somebody else tomorrow. I went to bed the same way I always went to bed. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you for this day, Lord. I know you'll wake me up tomorrow. And I know, Lord God, it'll be another day that you've given me. If not, I'll see you in heaven. But that morning, listen, it was about three weeks ago, I woke up and, and I heard a voice inside my head. How many of you know God has to get to your head before He can get to your spirit? And I heard this clamor. This mind talk inside my head. And it was, wasn't like a snarl. It wasn't like, okay, you'd recognize the devil in that voice immediately. In fact, it sounded almost like God. And that voice was telling me, you really don't believe that what you're saying is helping people. You really don't need to talk about that anymore. You really don't even need to be a preacher anymore because really in reality God's got people that's prepared, more qualified. And I listened to that. Listen to me now. I listened to that for 30 seconds maybe. That's too long. That's 29.29% 29 .29 too long. You ought not listen to any of that stuff for even a, a megasecond. And I listened to it. And I said, oh my God, what spirit is this? Hear me. He said, because I've been dealing with you about a wounded spirit and you've been teaching others and they've been being ministered to by me. And in fact, let me say this before I move any, along any further. Listen, it doesn't matter what I say, or whether you recognize me with what I say, what you do need to recognize and I need to recognize is that what God says through me. That's what matters. Anything else doesn't. And am I listening to this stuff? And I said, God, what spirit is this? Why am I dealing with this? Why is this going on on the inside of me? I couldn't even praise God at that moment. It was like, I was stuck. I was stuck. And that's what's happening to people today that are <coughs> God's people. Uh, they're being stuck. What I call, they've been imprisoned. I'm not talking about a physical prison. I'm not talking about going to jail. I'm talking about an imprisonment of the mind. How I many of you know your mind can get stuck on something that you can get obsessed with it and the routine of life becomes an obsession and it's the same old every single day? I said, God, what spirit is this? He said, this is the spirit of doubt. Did you know the spirit of doubt is the opposite of faith? Your objective and your faith is in God. And so Satan pulls out a strong one that I didn't recognize totally at that moment. And God said, this is doubt. How many of you know the fearful and the unbelieving, the doubters will not inherit the kingdom of God according to the book of Revelation? So this is a serious matter. This is not just a happy-go-lucky little bitty old problem. This is a huge problem. Because Satan was trying to get my mind to the point where I quit. I quit. And I said, well, Lord, how do I deal with this? He said, stand up right now and say it with all that you can that Jesus is Lord. 
That's what I did. I went outside. I went in the pole barn. I got in the pole barn, opened the door. I couldn't wait to get inside. I said, oh, God, you're Lord. Jesus is Lord. Then I started praying in the Spirit, and I started worshiping God and adoring the Lord. And that Spirit went... Just like that, just lifted. My point is this. It's important to recognize what spirit is trying to attach itself to you while that spirit is working. That's what the Lord showed me through that. It's important because we need to shut down stuff that is not the Holy Spirit. So here it is. I got to get through this because I got to move on next week to a spirit of bondage. But look at this a wounded spirit, the devil will use it and desire to assassinate your character, and he does it number one through offense. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10 through 12. What does it say? Matthew chapter 24, verse 10 through 12. Quickly, look at this. Then they shall be many offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Let's look at the next verse. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Number 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So what is this saying? Real simple. Jesus was saying in the last day, one of the things that would denote the last days would be offenses. So you understand that offenses, number one, here's what I would tell you because i got to move right on real quick. Here's what I would tell you. If you get offended, no, no, don't let me say it that way. How many of y'all looking at me? When you get offended? Yeah. Everybody in this room, you may get an opportunity today. I don't pray that on you. I don't want that on you. But I guarantee you, somewhere in your life living for Jesus, something's going to happen to offend you. I can guarantee you that. Jesus himself said it. I'm not being negative. I'm just telling you, We've got to know when the offense comes so we can get it off of us immediately. Get it off! Get it off! When the man told me one time, he said, you won't amount to anything, you're a loser, and you'll never make it as a preacher, and you'll never do this or that. It almost killed me when I was a babe in Christ to hear those words. Today, I would look at that man and say, oh my goodness, I'm glad you love me. You've got to look at it that way. It's important to understand offenses must be forgiven. They must be forgiven for your sake and their sake. And then once they're forgiven, you can give their trespass, whomever they may be, you can give their trespass to the Lord and give them to the Lord that they would be saved, blessed and encouraged and strengthened by God because God knows every person. Listen, people are offended and a lot of what's going on today is accusation. Even God's people are ignorantly accusing other of God's people as being this, 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 and this. Listen, you and I have no right or no privilege whatsoever to accuse people about their character. No. And we're not to judge their motives. No. No. Amen. You know what that is? That's called self-righteousness. I talked to a man the other day, a businessman that's worth millions of dollars. And he started spewing some stuff on the phone. I love him. I love him with all of my heart. I'm going to win him to Jesus if it's the last thing I do on this earth. I'm going to get him to Jesus. And he starts spewing this stuff. He said, well, I was in church uh, 25, 30 years ago. And he said, I'm not going to go back to church as long as I live because them people are, are mean. Them people are, are, are just trying to rule my life. And, and he went on and on and on. And I said, sir, I've heard that before. He said, well, what do you think about all these preachers that are filthy rich? I said, well, my goodness, God's Word does not tell us uh, money's a problem. The Bible tells us that the love of it is a problem. If a preacher's got money, let him have it. Glory to God. He said, well, didn't you take a vow of poverty? Don't you be putting a vow of poverty on me, friend. I ain't no po a poverty bower. 
And so I got to talking to him, and man, I had him that close in really just surrendering his life to Jesus. He said, well, I, I got to get up and go to eat. I said, oh my God, you better get up and go eat. Because one of these days, he's going to be ready. Because every time I talk to him, he talks about eternity. I don't even bring it up. He starts talking about it. He said, well, you know, I'm so-and-so years of age, and I don't know how much longer I got down here. I said, I know. God's going to have you down here until you get right with God. I know. And so offenses have to be forgiven. Number two. Now, let us look at this real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. I'll have you out here in just a few minutes. How many of y'all got a couple more minutes? Have you? Okay. I'm going to get down to some nitty gritty here. Okay, now look at this. I want to talk to you about self-opposing. Self-opposing oneself. Look at this, 2 Timothy. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God perhaps, prohibiture means in the old King James, perhaps he will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You remember last week that I gave you the scripture that says it's important to be established in the present truth? How many of y'all remember that? Come on, raise your hand. I want to know. Amen, boy. I've got some listeners out there. Hallelujah. And what does that mean? Established in the present truth. Here's what it means. Here's what I found out about a wounded spirit. A wounded spirit will cause a person a child of God, even to live too far into the future and not relax and live in the present. I don't think you caught what I said yet. Some of you did. Some of us are so filled with anxiety and so filled with, I want to do this and this, and that has not happened. You can't live in the present which means you can't smile hardly anymore. You can't laugh hardly anymore. It takes a whole lot just to get you to lift up one lip, let alone two lips. It's hard to be able to be expressive. It's hard to be able to be really happy. Somebody tells you a, a, a good, good joke. I know we shouldn't jest too much in the church. Because the scripture says we're to put away jesting. But when somebody says something real nice, my wife the other day, she, she had somebody on there and uh, there was this man laying in the, in the barber shop and uh, he was getting his, uh, you know, his face worked on, you know, like ladies get their nails worked on, all that stuff. And, and, but here he's laying there and there, you know, the barber's in there, he's shaving him and getting him ready. And then some woman, which was his wife, come up and kissed him real fast, but this man was a, a man. And the wife hid under uh, the barber chair, and he didn't know it was his wife, and he kind of grinned, and then he opened up his eyes, and he saw this man, boy, he goes, whoo! I mean, he got all excited. Well, I thought that was funny. I thought it was a little funny. There was nothing uh, immoral about it other than the fact that, you know, it's just a little peck, whatever the case might be. And I got to laughing about it, and my wife and her, and I got the internet on in the other room, and she just laughing to be that. I mean, she having a party all by herself. And sometimes I believe we need to be having a party all by ourselves with Jesus. We need to be having a, a, a good old time just knowing that God is good, glory to God, and he's moving on the inside of his church. But look at this scripture. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You could be a self-opposer because you've got a wounded spirit. A wounded spirit will cause self-opposition. Ladies, I want to ask you this question. When you look in the mirror, I know y'all pretty. And somebody, somebody asked on, on that show, uh, the Beverly Hillbillies, and asked Jeffro. he said, what's the difference between a woman and a man? Jeffro said, women are softer. 
Can you see that? I seen that on the internet the other day and just laughed. I was all by myself, but God was with me, so don't even worry about it, okay? But you understand that when we oppose ourselves, how does it look when you look in the mirror, ladies? When you look in the mirror, you see, I, we get up on Sunday morning. I, I'm going to tell a little story. We get up on Sunday morning. We get ready. We get up early. We go to bed pretty early on Saturday, usually. And then we get up, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, my wife, she is such a worker. She, such, she just loves me so much, and she loves the work of God so much, and she's all prepared. She's all getting ready. And we get up about 6. She gets up about 6. I get up about 6.30. I know when to get up because she's up. And so I get up, and I make me a cup of coffee. Yeah, amen. I make me a cup of coffee, and I get that coffee done, and then I sit down. She's in the back room, and she's in the bathroom, and she got this curling on. It's so hot, don't you be touching her curling on. And she got, puts it in her hair, and she's curling her hair. She's putting her makeup on. She's putting her eyes on. And then she's puts her dress on. She comes out with three different si kinds of dresses, and she says, which one do you like? And I said, oh my God, I like all of them. Just choose one. <laughs> you know? But a man goes in, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know I'm telling the truth. Uh, she, that woman getting fixed up takes her two hours to get fixed up. It takes about five minutes for a man to get ready. Let's go. You ready to go? Yeah, you know that's the truth. But when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Are you able to look in the mirror and say, hey, you. Hey, you. You're blessed of the Lord. You're highly favored. You're a woman of Proverbs. And you're blessed by God. Everything you do is going to prosper. Everywhere you go, whatever you say today, God's going to use you. Hallelujah. Or do you look at yourself and say, oh, my God, I'm in trouble. You may look at one of your eyes and your left eye don't look like your right eye. You're in trouble. You're in trouble. I mean, you're in hot water. And you don't want to go to the church looking like that. You've got one eye looking one way and one eye looking the other. You're just like some of these men. You know, they put one color sock on on one foot and one color sock on the other foot. And then they come to church and they go, oh, my God, well, okay. But a woman does that, it's over, man. You won't be able to talk to her for a solid week. Okay, I'm moving right along. So opposing yourself is because there's a wound of an unclean spirit there. No matter what. Now men, men, you do it too. If you're in any kind of ministry, you'll do it. Because of this simple fact that self-opposition is against the nature of God. What do you mean by that, preacher? This is what I mean. God's already declared over you that you're the head and not the tail. God's declared over you that you're prosperous in everything that you do. He wished above all things that your soul would prosper. You would be in good health even as your soul prospers. God says by His stripes you were healed. God says you've been saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb. God says you're bigger and better than that. You don't have to be on the tail end of things. You can be right in the middle of where God wants you. Because he said it. And then we go off and get in, get in a place where we just feel like, oh my God, I'm no value. I, I've got no value. I've got nothing to offer. I can't do anything. And you are stuck in a place in your mind. You don't tell me a mind can't get stuck. It can. You study neurology. And the, the study of neurology is the study of the nerves. And listen to me that can affect and bring disease to the human body. It affects the spinal cord, and it also affects the brain. Don't tell me that problems, if they're left unchecked and not taken care of, can't affect the way we think, because they can. Even the medical field will tell you that. It don't even take a preacher the medical field. Thank God for the medical field, right? Will tell us that. But listen to this. Number one, offenses will come. What do we do with offenses? We forgive. Number two, self-opposition will come. 
Why? I don't know. With me, it was drugs. My brain was so dead from drugs, so messed up. With some other person, it may be that they're addicted to something else. I don't know. Alcohol. Cussing. I don't know. But I'm just saying this. Get over opposing yourself. Because God says you're to love yourself as He loves you. Now, I don't mean get arrogant on me, because there is a spirit of arrogance. We don't want to talk about that right now. I don't mean that. But listen, listen to this. This is going to help you. Let's look at 2 Timothy 2.26, and this is what it says. Real quick, here's what it says. Same chapter, 2.26, and look, look what it says. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive of him by his own will. Here's what I call souls in prison. Souls in prison. An imprisoned soul cannot be fulfilled in life, even as a Christian. Because what Satan will do, he'll take your mind, mind, will, emotions, imagination, intellect, whatever it is, and he'll take your mind and freeze it and get it to stick on one thought. You understand what I'm saying? And it's an imprisonment. An opposing spirit produces an imprisonment of the mind. That's what he said. 24, 25, 26, right there in Timothy, that we're to be relieved of an opposing spirit of ourself. We're to be set free from it, and we're not to be held captive by an opposing spirit. Now, here's the biggest one of all, number four, unbelief. <clears throat> unbelief. Closing with this. Finishing up with this. Unbelief. I'm going to ask you where the rubber hits the road today. Right here, right now. Unbelief is the opposite of faith. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. It's the opposite of faith. Understand today that souls in prison can keep you stuck. Self-opposition produces a captive mind. And offenses produces it all. Offenses. If we hold offenses. Now let me sh share with you today two things. What's the difference between a weight and a burden? What's the difference? I hope you're getting something out of this today. What's the difference between a weight and a burden? The Bible tells us to, to lay aside every weight and sin. Every weight. Let me tell you the difference. A weight is something that Satan uses to keep you and I in bondage. A weight. It's not necessarily a sin. It's not necessarily something that God's not pleased with, but it's something that He's displeased with because we've allowed it to happen in our own mind and in our own spirit. A weight is something that if you pray about it, have you ever been living in life, and I know that you have, You've been living in life and you're a Christian. You love Jesus with all of your heart and you've just been doing something good for God that whole week. You've been winning people to Christ. You've been showing people the love of Jesus and you've just been ministering to as many people as you can and then all of a sudden while you're by yourself, you're devastated. You ever been there? Why is that? I'll tell you why that is. I'll tell you why that is. Because... Here, here's what one, a president said just the other day. And he said this, if, a man is going to use, if, if God is going to use a man or a woman for a great service, man, God will cause that man or that woman to fall apart before he could use them. I said, Donald Trump, I read it on the internet. I said, Donald Trump, I didn't want to hear that, man. I like you. You're all right, man. But you're kind of bold. But when he said that, and he's in reference to God, he's making reference to God. Aren't you glad for a man that's running for office that at least references God, the true and the living God? That's pretty big. And then he says that, he said, it was like God was speaking to me through the voice of another human being. And he was saying, yeah, I'm using you, and I'm going to use you even more in the future. But... 
you're, you're going to have to fall apart and realize you're going to be like the corn of wheat that falls into the ground. And if it, if it doesn't fall into the ground, it abides alone. And if it doesn't germinate, it can't produce a crop. When that seed is in the process of germination in the ground, it's in a process of dirt. And it has to be, as we are as God's people, God will test us. He will not tempt us, but He will test us. He will test us. He tested every man and woman of God in the Bible. Every one. How many of y'all ready to be used by God? I'm almost finished. Am I long-winded today? I feel like I am. I feel like I'm preaching all to myself. I'm going to tell myself, amen, brother. Amen. Amen. So let me give you this here. Am I where I was last year? Number two, am I in denial or am I going to recognize i got a wounded spirit that's been trying to deal with me? Am I in doubt about my walk with God? Then I would encourage that you pray today. I need to pray. Do I depend on myself or do I depend on God? What is the answer for my life? Let me tell you, the answer for every precious soul, every precious human being, is to depend completely on Jesus Christ. Totally. Totally. To stop this business of defending the way we want to live. You see, because God will bring people to our lives, and He will bring them to our lives to either help us or curse us. You've got to know the difference. I've got to know the difference. I don't get upset with people that are saying something that I don't agree with, but that doesn't mean I have to be their best friend either. You see, are we under full submission to Jesus? Do we die daily? Have our eyes been opened? You know, this is what I think right here. It's a little left 12. I'm almost finished, but listen. Do you understand that there's going to be a whole world to receive the Antichrist system because they don't have this information I gave you today. They just think, oh, I've got to eat. I've got to live. I've got to have a place to live. I've got to have health insurance. And did you know the government is swiftly trying to become a government ruled government that wants to rule your life, my life, and take control of what we eat or don't eat, can you see how clearly the Antichrist mark of the beast can be set in place? Just like that. And multiplied millions. And listen, you think, well, that's not going to happen in the church. Let me tell you something. There's an apostate church right now that's already being brought forth that will align themselves with the Antichrist system and the whole world will whore after the Antichrist through that religious system. It's in the making right now. It's been in the making for years. But now it's, it's getting to the forefront. What institution and what world religion has strong influence in politics? Did I say politics? And also has strong influence in the religious world? Think about it. I didn't even want to say that today, but it just come out. So here's what the devil will do. He'll come to deceive, deception. This is how he works. He'll come to accuse, and he'll come to bring in your life accusation to the point. Deception, temptation, and accusation. That's the way Satan works. He's either accusing, he's deceiving, or he's tempting. God does not tempt. How do I deal with temptation? Temptation is the easiest form of the devil's attack. Temptation is usually related to the, to the pleasures of the body. And the body says, I want this. Your spirit man says, no, you won't have that because you're going to please God. Accusation is when you accuse yourself to yourself or you accuse yourself about others or you accuse God, one of those three. We will accuse ourselves, and most cases, we accuse ourselves. 
we're not good enough, we're not qualified, whatever the case. Now I want to close with this, and I'm going to make a declaration here, and I want to share this last point with you here today. Last one. You remember Hannah in the Bible? And I've got to talk about this, about a wounded spirit, because I believe there's somebody listening. I don't know here or there or online listening today that need this. Hannah was a woman in the Old Testament, and she wanted to have a baby. And in those days, to have a baby, especially a baby boy, was the highest esteem that a woman could have, is to have a little baby boy. That's why it breaks my heart today that multiplied millions of people will vote for abortion on demand, even to the point where babies can be killed after they're born. Yeah. <sighs> Hannah wanted a baby so bad. And listen, I'm going to show you how sneaky the devil is. She wanted a baby. Her motive, her desire was perfectly godly. Are you listening to me? You hear me? And it's found in, in uh, uh, Samuel chapter 2 verse 9, uh, or yeah, chapter 29 verse 4 in, in that part of the Bible. And Eli, which is the high priest at that time in the Old Testament Bible, he watches over the house of God. And he came up to Hannah and he said, Hannah, what's wrong with you? She was so sorrowful. Now what I'm going to call unnatural sorrow. Unnatural sorrow. How many of you know you can grieve yourself to death? It's proven. You could grieve over all kinds of things. Just all kinds of things. Family member, job, money, not having enough. Just whatever. You could grieve over a lot of stuff. And it's called unnatural sorrow. There's an unnatural sorrow, and then there's a natural sorrow, and then there's a godly sorrow. And godly sorrow leads to repentance. So I was telling you a while ago about the weights and the burdens. The weights will not lift if they're of the devil. But a burden from the Lord, you go to prayer and God will lift it off of you. Amen. Hannah had a burden from the Lord, but she didn't know what to do with it. Eli looked at her and said, woman, what is the matter with you? Because he looked at her and said, have you been drinking in church? You're in the temple, and you're a woman of God. And to him, it appeared that Hannah was drunk in church. She was so intoxicated by the thought that I'm going to have a baby or I'm going to die. Unnatural sorrow. You hear me? Are you with me today? I'm telling you, unnatural sorrow is, is produced by a broken spirit. It's produced by a wounded spirit. Why can I say that? Because she was looking around to all of the other mothers in the kingdom, and they were having babies, and they were having baby boys, but here she is. She cannot have a baby, and it's killing her, destroying her. Her mind is fixed. I must have a baby or else I die. And Eli recognized it. And he began to speak to her and bring healing to that wounded spirit. And then God, listen to me, please, please. I'm trying to help here. God opened up her womb. And she brought forth the, the most godliest and the most anointed man-child in the world, Samuel. How many of us here today are about to produce something for God, but we're on the verge of walking away? Church, listen to me. I'm going to make this announcement today and this declaration, and I would like for you to pray this with me. Because I need this, you need this, we need this. We are so close to Christ's coming that some days I thank God this is my last sermon. 
That's the way I think. That's just me. I'm not trying to put that on anybody. But I'm telling you this. I'm ready when Jesus comes. And I know I'm ready. However, my heart bleeds for people that are broken by a wounded spirit. And I want to read this to you today and I want to declare this and I want you to pray this prayer with me. And I want us together to be able to get free of this. I wish I could come out to you today and, <clears throat> and, 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 and touch your life and say, I'm going to pull that wounded spirit out of you. I'm going to pull that unnatural sorrow out of you. I'm going to pull that pain out of you. The fact is, I can't do that. Only you can allow the Holy Spirit to pull that pain out of you. I knew a little boy that was molested when he was a child. He was molested. And that little boy was scarred because of that molestation. He had a wound inside him that just, just drove him to homosexuality. It drove him to per perverted. It drove him to all kinds of things in his life because somebody in his family abused him. And then I watched that boy get right with God. I watched that boy get cleansed and purged by the Holy Spirit and by God. And I watched that boy become a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I went to him and I said, man, what's happening in your life? He goes to prisons, he goes to jails, he goes everywhere. And God is using this young man to reach thousands of people for Christ. So what am I saying? I'm saying no matter where you've been and what you've done, Jesus can heal that wound. There may be a, a, a cut there. There may be a scar that gets laid open every time something happens. And it reminds you of that hurt and that pain. You see, a wounded spirit has pain associated with it. Severe pain. Depression. All those things. Honey, you, you've come up today. I, before we read this, are we going to read this together? Right before you read it. Okay. Um, Aaron, you can go ahead and put that on. Um, I just had a word from the Lord while he was sitting back there about opposing yourself. And you, maybe you really don't understand what opposing yourself is. But I felt like the Lord said there's people in here there that you get up and you say to yourself, you know, I, I hate myself. I don't like, I'm, I failed God so many times. How can he use me? Uh, I'm bad in the ministry. Things happen to me. Uh, you know, I had bad parents. Uh, I was molested. You know, or every time something happens, I'll never get over it. I'll be like this forever. And, and God wants to set people free this morning. Amen. You know, Amen. because you know, yesterday I talked to a friend of mine, a family member, and I said, you know, how, how come good people have children that are homosexuals, lesbians, praying parents, and all this stuff, then that child grows up and gives their heart to the Lord, but they, they still struggle. That's just one example with, who am I? And why did I have to go through this? You know, and, and I, I truly believe that we, we do not have to say that God, I'm glad God took me through that. Listen, God's plan is not that you go through a bunch of stuff so he can raise you up so you can minister to certain kind of people. Does he take what you've been through because of our own choices? Yes. But his plan is that you would say to yourself, I'm not defeated. I am going to amount to something in the name of Jesus. But because of the hardships that you've gone through and the trials, as soon as it floods back in, because the enemy is listening to what you say and then things begin to happen and you say it again well I'm never going to amount to nothing 
<clears throat> nobody listens to me. Nobody cares. I'm never going to get promoted on the job. My, my place is at the low end of the stick. Listen, God wants to change our whole direction and thinking because yep. it's in the gates, sure. the eye gate, the ear gate, sure. the mouth gate. Sure. And we got to say to the, not even in joking, <clears throat> don't joke even that you're, you know, oh yeah, I'm going to always be that way. You know, I'm, uh, you know, whatever. I'm too thin. I'm too fat. I'm this. I'm always going to be this way. Don't declare it out loud because listen, the only place that the devil cannot hear is when you're praying in the spirit. Oh. So when we pray and we say this stuff, we, listen, we need to be asking God, hey, so we I'm not going to pray say this prayer, man. I'm telling you. So if yeah. that's you this morning, I want yeah. you to come forward as we stand together this morning. <clears throat> Yeah. There's, there's the, that opposing spirit that tells us we're not going to amount to anything, or I've been a bad mother, I've been a bad father, whatever it is. I've let my kids down. I, you know, we've done it ourselves. Put the ministry first, and and never did certain things with our children that we should have done it with. You know, and then years later, you're still having the spirit of regret. So I, I feel like God wants to set people free in their mind Amen. on how Amen. to get the victory over that. So, Amen. you know, as we're going to pray all this together, if that's you this morning and you, you just, you just want to come forward, acknowledge, hey, it, you know, God, I'm here to get something uh, straight with you. Yeah, I'm going to do that in just a minute, okay? Okay, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to read to you today. The symptoms, just read them. What are the symptoms of a broken spirit, a wounded spirit? Anxiety, and if this is in your category, there's many other things, but listen. Anxiety, depression, irritability, mood swings, things that cause things to bring disorders, isolation, compulsive behavior, and also the eating disorder. I just wrote down just a few. Any of those things that you might think you're, that you're dealing with, I don't want you to think that you have to do something here. It's because you want to be free and recognize a wounded spirit. It's very, very important. It wasn't until I was free from this that I really began to just be able to be fulfilled in life. In my spirit years ago, God began to show me. So if you're that person, lift up your hands right now, and I pray for you right now, right here. Okay? Father, I pray for these that have come forward and these that have their hands up. First of all, they're being honest with themselves. I need help. I cause things to distract me and isolate me. Don't be so prideful here this morning to not say, I need help. If you need help, raise your hand. Please, nobody's holding it against you. Heavenly Father, I want you to deliver and I want you to set them free. I put the axe of the root of God. Say that to yourself. I put the axe of the root of the Spirit to this matter. The Word of the Lord. I put it to a wounded spirit. Heal me, Jesus and heal me right now of isolation. Heal me of depression, of anxiety, that out of the blue, I just feel devastated. That wounded spirit will not control my life anymore. Set me free, Jesus. And help me to see that in the future I know where to place this wounded spirit in Jesus' name. Okay, if you find your seats there, we're going to pray this prayer together as a church. And then we're going to close. And here's what we're going to pray, and I want you to repeat it after me. Today I declare I am clean. By Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus, I am free from the spirit 
of being wounded. Through the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, and His death and burial and resurrection, I am free. My life is the Lord's. I'm a living, breathing tabernacle. My life is owned by the Lord Himself. I am not my own. Jesus owns me. Therefore, Satan, I know your tricks. You have illegally trespassed in my life. You are a thief. I chase you out through the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. You're defeated. You're finished with a wounded spirit in me. I forgive right now who have offended me from the past, present, and future. Now look at your wives and husbands and family members and say that I am free of offense of the past, present, and future. I remit the sins of all quickly from this day forward I give them to the Lord to bless them and bless them in their life for the Lord that they are not my enemies Satan you're my enemy therefore I am loosing them from the schemes of the devil never again Will you trespass in my life through a wounded spirit? I've been made whole by Jesus himself. From this day forward, the door is closed to you, Satan. The acts of God's word has already defeated you on the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll tell you this, and then we're, we're going to go eat, right? But I'll tell you this. Satan will come back. And he will come back with trying to get you to be wounded. But if you'll follow what, what I said here and this right here, you'll begin to recognize the difference between the Holy Spirit, your spirit, and the spirit of the devil. You begin to see it, and your life is going to get bigger and more better. Amen. God love you, man. Go in Him. Encourage one another. In Jesus' name.